So for, with that, I'm going to turn it to Ramesh Srinivasan from UCLA. Thanks. They gave me a replacement. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hello, everybody. How are you this morning? I'm very happy to be here. Um, I just want to, OK, great. This looks like this is working. Um, let me just mention a couple things. First of all, I'm extremely honored to be here at the Skull World Forum. I had been following this forum for some years, so I was very honored to be invited to share some of my research uh, in the context of this panel. Also, you can interact with me um, via Twitter, which is something I'm trying to use more often. <laughs> and uh, my handle is there um, up on the page itself. All right, fantastic. So these are very, very timely issues that we're engaging with here. Of course, many of us woke up this morning reading the testimony that Mark Zuckerberg gave to um, the Senate. Um, and some of us were watching it hours long. Um, and I want to sort of talk about a few parameters of the problem and try to think about this theme of our forum around proximity and think about that as sort of a mechanism of working past some of these problems that we see in terms of the disconnections between models of collection, aggregation, calculation, and therefore responsiveness around data and people themselves. Right? So this is one of many stories that have made the rounds, uh, written by journalists that are friends of mine. And this is a story uh, that ProPublica published that for approximately $30, using Facebook as a micro-targeting platform, um, about 2,500, 2,300 to be exact, people were identified on the Facebook platform that were identified as being Jew haters, neo-Nazis, and so on. So the question here is not necessarily the fact that people might identify as such, but what are the bases, algorithmically and in a back-end data-based sense, by which people might be identified as such, and how for such a low number, such a small amount of investment, you could access and target people based on these sorts of categories that they themselves might not fully identify with, and as a result, they might become those categories themselves. Um, so these are common issues, and this is a question of micro-targeting that can occur through data models that are built about people that platforms such as Facebook and Analytica as an example are symptoms of a larger architecture that doesn't have necessarily reciprocity, communicativeness, transparency, and accountability around personal data, around user data. So this is not simply an issue of micro-targeting using data-oriented platforms, but it's also a question of algorithmic visibility. Increasingly, we all know that that which we see online counts for us as what is knowledge, right? So I talk to my students about this all the time. Generally speaking, 70% of the time, we click on one of the first three results we see on a Google search. 95% of the time, we don't get to page two. And this is a question not simply of ordering, but of filtering of information. So then the question is, is what are the human values for which algorithms produce the visibility and therefore the construction of what counts as knowledge? And how does that shake and impact our lives personally, but also the institutions, and more importantly, the democracies within which we aspire to live? And so if that which is popularized is that which produces more attention and therefore more engagement on a platform, which is essentially what these platforms are monetized for, and the underlying, as Tim O'Reilly puts it, master algorithm is one of capital valuation, then we can see how misinformation and specifically targeted disinformation can actually be the secret sauce that produces great amounts of meaning for these platforms themselves. So this, of course, is a well-known story, a story that involves groups like Cambridge Analytica, of which, again, I want to argue are symptoms of a larger issue. Cambridge Analytica spent approximately $1 million. We're able to access at least 50 million accounts through a, a range of different mechanisms that we've read about. But we also know, in the case of the Russians, and in the case of the, that we saw about $46,000 being spent, 0.5 of 1% on social media and digital kinds of micro-targeting and misinformation that represented such a small amount compared to what the Trump and Clinton campaigns spent on the very issue itself. So 
The key here is not necessarily the extraction of data and the monetization of data and the manipulation of data to present a, a worldview that might actually steer us in particular directions and shake us personally and politically and so on. But it's also the ability to use such data models in psychometric manners. So this is the ocean model. Um, feel free to take a look into this. But what is very interesting here is that I would be identified not just as a 40-year-old professor, but as a 40-year-old professor who's neurotic in particular manners and open in other manners. So there's a potential to reach someone in a much more subtle manner using data models that are produced about oneself that can then impact one's personal behavior. And this is part of what was being used by Analytica. It's unclear whether this was effective necessarily, but to me it represents a very personal and therefore political transgression into our lives and into our democracies. So these are symptoms, symptoms of a larger problem, which I want to speak about. Oh, I'm sorry, this is, a, this is actually Michal Kozinski's research, which ended up influencing the ocean model, which was then used by Analytica in various manners. So Michal is one of my informants in a book I'm writing about these very topics. So this is um, the title of one of my earlier books. And in this book, Who's Global Village, I'm trying to consider not just Western citizens and those of us who live in democracies or representative democracies, but the people more largely of our world. And what I believe is we can interpret this idea of proximity in relation to our data, not in a spatial sense, but in terms of our control, our awareness, our visibility, our literacy, and our power over the data that are being collected about us and how those data are being computed and engaged with to influence what we see and how we see it. So in that sense, I ask us to think about those that are emerging users of the internet, the peoples of the global south, the peoples of diverse cultures and countries. And so I talk about this in this book around this idea of ontology, which is basically a term that represents how different people see the world how different people of diverse cultures organize the world, think about the world. And accordingly, we might think about data in somewhat similar manners. We might think about questions of what kinds of data we, in our diverse context, choose to make public, choose to circulate, and in what manners. So I ask us to think about tools and systems that can influence the circulation and production of data in ways that are not just human-centered, but also culture-centered, considering that the vast majority of new users of the internet more largely and mobile devices are coming from cultures that are not part of these apparatuses of data collection and monetization. So these are some models of ontology that I describe in my work that I can elaborate on further. This is a lightning talk session, so I'll just wrap up very quickly. And this is an example, which I just describe in chapter four of my book, um, where I see a group of Native Americans looking at their collective data that are being recorded about them, but instead of one person for a computer, or one person per interface, or one person per system, they are collectively looking at that data. And I think that's just an important reminder that these data issues are not just about us individually as seemingly atomized users, but they're also about our communities and the ethics and norms and cultural values that we share and believe in. And this is something I'd like to elaborate on further. So there are various pieces of software, one is called Mukuru, that actually allows various user communities to build their own sorts of digital networks and organize how they choose to circulate, transmit, and classify data. So we're, of course, at an impasse right now. We have master infrastructures that are attractive to us, that have aggregated so much attention. They have network effects that are producing so much value for these companies, but also for us as users, as we can explore the larger world. But there's also a possibility for us as users, and this is what I demand, to actually figure out ways to exert our own values, our own belief systems, our own ethical principles in relation to these companies. What we have is a disconnection right now. Those that are connecting us all are actually disconnected in many ways from the users and political kinds of considerations that users face. So what we need is more engagement, more inclusivity, and we have to take it from there. So I'm gonna talk about this, I hope, with some questions that you're gonna ask me. Um, so that's it for me, thank you.
I did that lightning style, I hope. <laughs> no, it was. It was very, it was very lightning. It was great. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick up uh, where you left off, which is to ask, you know, you, you said something that I found very compelling, which was the idea of, you know, the very people who are supposed to be connecting us are somehow disconnected from, yeah. from the process. And you talked about needing to put tools and systems in place. And I know you started to talk one, about yeah. one, but I would love to hear a bit more, you know, kind of practically speaking, you know, how does that work where, based on where people are creating these new tools and the communities where that, that those new tools are being created in the first place are not in the communities where you're working. How do we actually right. practically facilitate that? Yeah, it's a very challenging question. I mean, the, part of the issue is that as people across the world, you know, in their own embedded systems of culture and politics, turn to larger scale platforms that are governed and implemented and designed from afar, the biases and ways of thinking about data and monetizing data and collecting data are going to be exported onto those people, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't think, of course, the solution is simply these kinds of localized systems, proximity-based systems, if mm -hmm. you will, that I was starting to allude to mm -hmm. <laughs> at the end of the lightning talk. Um, I could talk about that for hours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think we have a moment of inflection right now. We have a moment of opportunity. And it's not really about Facebook either, and it's not about Analytica. It's the underlying architecture and the absence of transparency and accountability upon which personal data rests. So as we think about this moment, this opportunity we face, where there is a great amount of public and media scrutiny on these systems and the ways they're governed or not, we have the possibility of, of, of asking for, unlike a lot of the questions being asked by our senators, <laughs> asking for Mark Zuckerberg asking for those who are building these systems to say, hey, we want to give you some opportunity to do some kind of localized proximity-based governance mm -hmm. of your data, mm -hmm. right? And we are vouching that we will use that local data in these ways and not these other ways. So the, the question is really one of communication. So, you know, as a former engineer, and a lot of you in this room are, we often think about that which we build as kind of rec in internally optimized, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I built this algorithm, I want to make it quicker. Mm -hmm. But what purposes it serves is something that we, don't, we can't always predict. That's why we need more heterogeneous groupings mm -hmm. where folks who understand humanity, understand society, understand culture, are part of the design room and are part of the process moving forward. It's not just build it and maybe it breaks and then we deal with it. It's an iterative, communicative process that mm -hmm. we need to engage in. Great. Yeah. Thank you for that. Pleasure. So much we could be, oh, thank you. So much more we could pleasure. get into. Wait, thank but don't leave you. yet. Oh, okay. Okay. Don't go yet. Um, we haven't had an opportunity for our audience. Oh. Um, so uh, I'm just going to open it up to at least one question, hopefully. We have about three minutes uh, from the audience. Yes, right over here. How can we govern these systems? What are the political entities that can do that? Our, I mean, that's, I think it can start there's a couple issues here. One is sort of the possibility of using tools that, are, that allow individuals themselves to sort of be able to regulate what kinds of data are or are not being accessed and engaged with, with them themselves. So they're individualized oriented types of tools. But I also think that there are mechanisms, just like basically Facebook take, take for example, is an architecture that's designed for not openness in terms of transparency and accountability, but openness in terms of building and layering various applications on top of Facebook, right? What they call bad actor third party applications, Candy Crush Saga. I get invited to join Candy Crush Saga every day, right? So let's think about, instead of thinking about third party applications that can then pull data from you, let's think about third party applications can then live on top of platforms that allow those who use, collectively use those applications to actually do that form of, gov those forms of governance. So I don't think, so, so my point being is that any community, could be a place-based community, could be an online community, could be a community of interest, should be able to use some sort of layered application on top of these platforms by which they can actually manage and govern what is flowing where and to whom. And that is sort of the, mo that's the model that I think we need to work with. We need modular models that can then be applied to community-based forms of governance. I'm not saying we're going to re all reject Facebook. I find that to be kind of a naive approach. But we need ways to insert our own governance on top of these platforms. Thank you thank so you, much. You. Um, so thank you for, thank you. for those My remarks. Really appreciate it.